Well, apologies for the abrupt end to that uh, previous video. For some reason, it just decided to cut out <laughs> just as we were about to finish this page. So I'm going to start this video by finishing that last page. Now, I've already written some stuff here that I'm going to share with you. Um, this is just to kind of finish up what we were talking about. Using unit analysis, we can find that P, T, D, P, D, T all have set units, fixed units. And then the argument goes, K must have units of 1 over time. And the reason that it must is because dp dt on the left hand side of the equation must have the same units as the right hand side of the equation, that term on the right hand side. As a matter of fact, in general, when we're talking about differential equations or any equation in any context, when you're examining models, each term in the model has to have the same units, or else you wind up with something like adding apples and oranges, which of course you can't do, as the saying goes. So you have to have the same units to be able to add or subtract quantities. And that's what we mean by terms, each term. So if you have an equation that looks like a equals b plus c, then all three of these terms must have the same units. And that means if we know the units for A are miles per hour, then that means B and C must be in miles per hour, or else it cannot be a functional equation. The other thing to keep in mind when dealing with equations, and this is going to affect us quite a little bit in this class, is that no exponent can have the exponent itself can't have units. So if you raised something to a power, so if you raised, um, like you raised A to the power B, right, then that whatever quantity B is has to have literally no units at all. There's no way for that to work, right? You can't raise miles per hour to the seconds, you know, it, it doesn't make any sense. You could only raise it to a numerical value with no units. So that gets us to the end of this page and allows us to begin the next page. And so that's where we're going to kind of pick up where we left off. So we can expect a range of possible solutions that are all going to follow exponential curves. And the exponential curves are coming from as a result of the solutions looking like exponential curves, something like, you know, e to the power something, right? And we know that because we're talking about the equation from the previous page of dp dt is equal to some constant times p. It's literally saying the rate of change of a function is equal to some constant times that function. And as we discussed in class last time, there's only two ways for you to get a function that is basically equal to its derivative. And that's if you're talking about an exponential or if you're just talking about the boring old y equals zero or p equals zero in this case, right? So this is a first order equation because it only contains first derivatives. And we already talked about first order, second order, stuff like that. But it's also referred to as an ordinary differential equation. Sometimes it's abbreviated O, D, E, an ordinary differential equation, because it contains no partial derivatives. And those of you who have had Calc 3 recognize partial derivatives. The partial derivative of y with respect to x, these little curly d's get used for the partial derivative, right? So that's what we mean when we say partial derivative. And if you haven't seen those before, if you haven't taken Calc 3, that's okay. We're only going to run into them a couple of times in this class, and they'll be in context, and they'll make sense. So don't worry about it. So if we're going to approach, and, and by the way, that means that we're really going to be sticking to ordinary differential equations in this class. You can take more classes in differential equations that deal with partial differential equations, if you like. Uh, so we're going to approach this using an analytic technique. And if we wanted to solve this, we'd have to have some kind of method for being able to solve it. Now, I don't want to spoil the ending, but that just basically involves the derivative or excuse me, the integral, so integrating this thing. But we're not actually going to do it just yet. We're just going to kind of wave our hands and say, using the analytic technique called separation of variables, it turns out that this thing right here has a general solution that looks like this. P of t equals some constant times e to the power k times t. 
Now, if you're paying attention, you recognize that that k, that was really our constant of proportionality. And that's from the original equation, right? That's sitting right there. But this c right here, this is another constant, but that's a constant that comes from integration. So if you think back to Calc 1, everything was, you know, don't forget to add plus c, plus c. Well, that's where the c pops up in our solution, the integration. Right? So this thing right here is what we call a general solution, right? This thing right here is a general solution, and it's a general solution because of that constant right there, the constant from integration. And we can check that it actually is a solution. We can check that something solves a differential equation by doing a straight up verification. We can verify any DE solution via substitution. And the nice thing about this is, this method always works for us. We just have to know what we're doing. And so what we're going to do is we're going to start with the, the differential equation, right? And so that means for us here, we have, <coughs> excuse me, dp dt equals k times p. And then the second step is to sub in the solution, and that's my little abbreviation for solution. And the sub, uh, sub in for solution means that we're going to substitute in to the original differential equation. Everywhere that there was a p, we're going to sub in our general solution, right? This guy up here. So we're going to substitute that in. I'm going to use color coding to make some sense out of it. So I'm going to take the derivative with respect to t of c e to the k t. And that's got to be equal to, the question is, is that in fact equal to some constant times the solution, the proposed solution, I guess we could say, c e to the k t. So the question is, is that in fact equal? That's what the question, or that's the question that we're asking when we substitute in something to check it. And this is not a particularly hard one. It really comes down to verifying the solution by doing some manipulation. And so for us, we just have to take the derivative on this side of c times a constant times e to the constant times t. And for us, that's pretty easy. That's just a constant times c e to the kt. A little bit of uh, product or uh, chain rule there lets us take that derivative pretty quickly. The other side is just k times c e to the kt. So without a whole lot of fanfare, we've just verified that in fact this is a solution, right? So our p of t equals c e to the kt solves the differential equation. It makes a true statement when we plug it in. So verifying literally means to show that something is true. And so that's what we did here. We verified by substitution. And it just shows that that's a correct answer. And down at the bottom of this page, you'll note that it says, because of the C, this is actually what we call a general solution, because there's actually infinitely many solutions. So a general solution, to kind of continue with our color coding up here, our general solution is a general solution because it contains infinitely many solutions. Right? If you want to know about a, a particular solution, you have to have a particular initial condition. And so an initial condition for us is something like, well, what's your population to begin with? So if you have our initial condition of an initial population of, I don't know, 200, then that means your initial population, sometimes it's written like this, p of 0, or sometimes it's written like this, p with a little subscript 0. They both mean the same thing. That's equal to 200. And so if, if we know our initial population is 200 individuals, whatever they are, then we can find a particular solution. 
Notice this thing right here is called an initial condition. This thing that we're going to do right here is find a particular solution. So we do that by saying, okay, we're going to start with our P sub zero equals 200, but that also must be equal to what we get when we plug in 200 into my original differential equation, which is C E to the K times T, which in this case is zero. And so we have 200 equals C times K, excuse me, times E to the K times zero. So 200 equals C times E to the zero. Well, E to the zero is not zero. E to the zero is actually one. So that factor right there kind of goes away and we're left with our constant is exactly equal to 200. Our initial condition is the C value right there. So it turns out that C is the initial population. And so that means in any situation like this where we have exponential growth, anytime we want to throw in an initial population, we just substitute it right in there for the value C. And then we have a model that predicts how this thing is going to grow. So after all is said and done, we have a particular solution that looks like this. P of T equals 200 E to the KT. Now, we don't know what K is. That's the exponential growth constant. But whatever it is, this will model that growth. So we'll hit the pause button right here. Actually, well, will we? Yeah, we'll hit the pause button right here because the next page gets into some new material. So we'll run the next video after this point.